Oh my goodness. I was joking that, that uh, we're all starting to get full and we're about to get even more full, but luckily the tops of our heads can explode and accommodate even more um, information and insight and, and knowledge as, as it's heaped upon us. Um, and for our next installment, I'm thrilled to uh, call to the podium, Mary Carr. I get very overstimulated when I see all of you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you all for being here when you'd rather be at the beach. Um, you know, I'm going to talk, I think, today about um, pretty much the ways I avoided writing what I had to write. And um, I think the hardest thing about memoir in particular, I think about writing any, for anybody, there is a kind of false you that, uh, that goes between you and the page that tells, uh, tells you constantly uh, who you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to represent yourself and that will interfere with what, uh, with what it is that you actually have to say. Sorry. I was going to quote from Thomas Merton on this, who's one of my favorite writers. If you haven't read his, uh, oh, I can't do it. I'm sorry. Um, but for me, the hardest things about memoir are psychological and social and uh, ethical. How you deal with other people and how you deal with that part of yourself that wants to be seen in a certain way. My mind is constantly asking two questions. Um, one is, where am I in line? And the second one is, what would I prefer? And what I would prefer is to be first in line. Um, but I'm mostly not first in line. I mean, most of us are not first in line. Um, and that urge to be first in line, I think, I, I read in the New York Times science section at some point, some article that I'm sure is completely bogus, but where they, they said that about 90% of what we think is actually about social order. And if you listen to your mind, I'm, I'm a meditator, and if you listen to your mind of a given day, especially if you live in New York City, it's like, does my butt look that big, you know? <laughs> Why is she getting that coffee first? I was here in front of her. Um, he should turn already. Um, why didn't he brush his teeth? You're constantly judging and criti critiquing and measuring where you are in the tadpole swim. Um, and this interferes with your ability to tell the truth, I think, in, in any of the deep, interesting ways. Um, I'll tell you why I went into memoir. Not long before my, my mother died, there was a guy redoing the tile in her kitchen. And my sister and I were there, and she, he held up a tile that had a perfect circle in it, and he looked at my mother, who was then this little gray-haired 80-year-old woman, and he said, Miss Carr, this looks like a bullet hole. And my sister, thinking as though it were possible to embarrass my mother, said, um, isn't that where you shot at daddy? <laughs> and my mother said, no, uh -uh, that's where I shot at Larry. Over there is where I shot at your daddy. <laughs> and if you think about it, with characters like that, why would you make shit up? <laughs> I mean, they're just going to be better than, than what you can think of. Um, this attitude of my mother's, by the way, about shooting at people she was kin to, um, uh, or I'm not kin to, uh, sleeping with, I should say. <laughs> and she slept with a lot of people, apparently. She was married seven times, and I don't know where the other ones went, but. Um, she was a very capricious creature, and her explanation of events changed depending on her mood and, and real you know, who her audience was and who she felt she was at the moment. Um, when she came to New York City to, and met my fancy New York publisher, my 
publisher kind of teased her about the bullet hole story and said, you know, Miss Carr, I'm, I, my kitchen in Brooklyn is not very big, and I think if I were shooting at my husband, you know, I could hit it. And uh, my mother said, well, oh, she was offended. She was huffy. She was like, I wasn't trying to hit him. <laughs> and Barbara said, well, what were you trying to do? And she said, I was trying to get his attention. <laughs> this is completely the opposite explanation she gave my soon-to-be brother-in-law when he came to her home in the ringworm belt, as I think of it, in East Texas. <laughs> and he said, uh, Ms. Carr, how did that hole, bullet hole, He's uh, Sicilian. He said, I have a genetic memory of having bullet holes in my house. And <laughs> how did that bullet hole get there? And she said, he moved. <laughs> <laughs> so it tells you several things that make writing about these people um, difficult. Why well, maybe my first book about my childhood was in some ways the hardest to start and yet the easiest to finish once I sort of had the courage to actually get down to it. Why well, it took me 20 years of, of psychic struggle and avoidance in various forms to get down to it. Actually, it, it took me 30 years. If you, if you account for the fact that at age 10, I wrote in the only journal I have from childhood, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. Um, this story should also tell you that truth in my family is a very slippery creature. It changes uh, depending on the season. My, our coat of arms could actually be drawn from something my sister used to stay, say, still says at, her, at the holiday table. It's really a motto of hers that she says completely without irony. Um, a good lie well told and stuck to is frequently better than the truth. You know, Nixon couldn't have said it better. <laughs> the other thing this should tell you is that these suckers that I share DNA with are smart, mouthy, opinionated, and also well-armed. <laughs> you don't want to piss them off. Um, on the upside of, of writing about people like this, other than the great stories they provide you with, um, is that my mother, who headed up most of the flaming jackpots in my, in my first book, was really didn't give a rat's ass what anybody thought about her. She was, uh, had studied painting in New York. She was a portrait painter and fancied herself a bohemian, even though she lived most of her life in this little backwater. Uh, but she understood point of view. She was very, she read voraciously, and she understood a subjective perspective on something. But she also said to me when I notified her that I was going to write about these events, which included her psychotic episode where she tried to stab me with a butcher knife and set fire to all our toys. She said, if I gave a shit what these idiots thought about me, I would have been baking cookies and going to the PTA, which I did not bother to do. Um, the other thing that was really helpful was that how wildly devoted I was to these people. I think the best books, even if there's anger or disappointment in them, and there's always anger and disappointment when we're dealing with people we love, the best books are written out of love. If you, if you want to get revenge, you know, hire a lawyer or buy, or buy a firearm. Um, I'd left home uh, at 17 and I spent most of my life really wanting to believe who these people said they were and wanting to believe uh, their deep and abiding love for me. And I studied them all, really. I was kind of an acolyte to all of them. My mother was a kind of tormented, wounded genius who's sacrificed her painting career to take care, to wallow with the ignorant peasants in our hometown. And this included my stoic oil worker daddy who paid the bills and plotted to work and uh, really tolerated kind of brutal treatment at her hands to keep us all together. My sister Lisa was a brick. She was cool and blonde and had big boobs and was athletic. And she could pass in the outer world in a way that I couldn't. 
as she later liked to say, you were just a pain in the ass and I wasn't. <laughs> Spoken like an older sister. From age about 13, she pretty much just vanished from the house and would worm her way into the household. The, mo the more conventional the household, the better. Um, she even began telling people that her real parents had been killed in a car wreck and that her father was Italian when she started dating an Italian guy. And I backed this stuff up because I knew that being related to the rest of us in some ways would cost her her reputation, which she was sort of trying to build uh, with the local people in the country club. I was kind of a, I was a cheap date, as, as Heather McHugh would say in this way. But there were schisms, obviously, between the people, these people I, in some ways, worshipped and adored, and the love they professed for me, and the resonant pain left over from living with their not inconsiderable horseshit. Um, starting with my parents' first two fundamental lies. The first sentence is an utterance that is almost never not a lie. I am not drunk. <laughs> If someone is telling you they're not drunk, invariably they are. <laughs> it's like guys who say their beautiful, dumb girlfriends are really smart in a special way. <laughs> the second sentence, everything is okay, is true just often enough to jack with your ability to trust what you're seeing. Um, I swallowed whole hog many of the statements that my family issued, and yet it was at some cost to my own insides. I had to sort of, and I have to say, I'm not special in this. I don't think I'm in any way rare or special. I mean, maybe my family was better armed than yours, <laughs> but I like to say only the people you love most in the world can break your heart because they're the only ones who can. And the most privileged person in this room from the nicest family has suffered the torments of the damned at the hands of the people they care most about. Parents, children, husbands, lovers, whoever. Siblings. Um, and I also say that a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one person in it. <laughs> and I also knew that I grew up white in a country that privileges that and that my teeth came in straight even though we couldn't afford braces and that I was naturally skinny and uh, in the richest country in the world. So I don't see myself as this uh, Dickensian orphan. Um, by the way, I'm going to talk for maybe 10, 15 more minutes, and I really like questions from you guys. So I, I'm a kid. Think of me in my early 20s as, as a girl uh, who's already been moving around, has lived in several states for no particular reason. I left at 17 to live with a bunch of drug dealers on the West Coast. I lived in a pink Lincoln Continental for a while. Um, and I spent the next 20 years pretty much avoiding who I really was on the page and writing. Um, in college, I never took a literature class, even though I knew since I was five that I wanted to be a, a poet and later apparently an, a memoirist. Um, and I moved from California to Minnesota to Boston to Mexico to New York to the UK. Um, and I had snakes in my head. I mean, I think if you deny who you are long enough, if you, if you put all your effort and energy into this false self that I started out talking about, um, I was sort of, when I wrote, I, I liken it to a woman in a, like, getting on a stripper pole wearing a metal diving suit, you know, like from the old days. It's, it's hard to move around. I always like the Cormac McCarthy quote about this. The mind's, let's see, what is it? The mind's at odds to know itself, for the mind is all it has to know it with. Just so. Best not to look in there. <laughs> um, I soaked myself as a young poet going to graduate school, and the French poets who had enthralled T.S. Eliot at the same age I was, I was 22 when I was first writing poems in 23 when I got to grad school. He'd been studying, uh, he'd been writing proof rock at age 22, by the way. He was, of course, Harvard educated and had been philosophy student of George Santayana. You know, I was a high school dropout who knew the alphabet up to the letter J. Um, 
And unlike Eliot, I pronounced the Sorbonne where he studied the Sorbonne. <laughs> and the French guys I read, I read in translations, Rimbaud and, and, and uh, Baudelaire by Enid Starkey. And I wore black clothes and scarlet lipstick and, and hung out in bars uh, and scribbled, scribbled these vague, languid poems about Paris, a place I had hardly been and a man I'd left there but barely remembered. And those young poems of mine were sort of sequined and, and uh, embroidered with classical reference to, references to writers I had hardly, hardly read. The cynic Diogenes, whose motto, live like a dog, was sort of suitable for my faux punk facade. And so what did I write about? I wrote about wanting to get laid and not getting laid and getting laid badly. I wrote about wanting a guy to leave, wanting a guy not to leave, and then he leaves. In a persona poem, I wrote in the voice of an old gambler, kind of making these stiff Mallarmé-type gestures about the nature of chance, this kind of world-weary person. The person I wanted to be, the people I wanted to be, would have been, would have been T.S. Eliot and Wallace Stevens. And uh, again, you think of Eliot, somebody once quipped that Eliot was tight as a rolled umbrella. You know, and I was more like a you know, shot pinball or something, ricocheting around. The other person I really liked who was heir, of course, to Eliot and Stevens is that New York school magician, John Ashbery. My thesis on him was over 100 pages. Uh, this deciphering a guy who admits he's indecipherable. And so you think about this trio of poets, these poets that I'm trying to be, they, they are all classically edu educated, and I'm a kind of raised by jackals, American aborigine, um, at, who has, you know, they're all cool, they're all emotionally reticent, and I have the kind of bouncy disposition of a, I say it had, did I say had the bouncy, did I had that, I have the bouncy disposition of a decent cow dog. Um, but my idea of telling the family story was to obscure any actual data about what happened, obscure any memory, and write around. I always say it was like a dog staked to a pole, and that I just wrote around and around what I was trying to write, and, and as I wrote, the circles got smaller. Um, here's a, since Heather McHugh is there, I, I found an excerpt of a, I'm writing a book on memoir now. This is one of, it's horrifying to read this. It's one of the poems I wrote in 1979 that Heather actually tried to edit, God love her. I think she just went through and took out all the articles or something, <laughs> left everything but the verbs. Um, so my mother has, it's, a, it's called Civilization and Its Discontents, which is of course the most pretentious title referring to the <laughs> Freud book, as though I spent my spare time, you know, studying uh, Viennese psychotherapist. Um, and, and this is a scene where my mother takes all my toys outside. I mean, think of it. You can write a dramatic scene where a woman takes all a kid's toys outside, sets him on fire, and then menaces him with a butcher knife. Or you can write this. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so ashamed. In 1959, some doctors sedated a Texas ho housewife, fastened electrodes to her temples, and flipped on the current. Her hair singed curl loosely around her eyes, which are pale green and dumb in the photo of her release. This is where the story ends for the housewife who had once danced flamenco in a bowling alley. It's hard to say how much of her daughter burned away. She evaporated into puberty and gin. I mean, what is that? So I won't even bother to say what all's wrong with this as a piece of the snotty devil may care tome, which is better fit for Letterman the uneven syllabic pattern, the, the, if you could see it, there are these violent enjambments I can't even bring myself to read. Plus there's no data about the woman or why she's crazy or why anybody would give a shit. Um, here's why I don't write fiction, because when I try to make stuff up, it's just bad. I don't know how to tell you. You know, she danced flamenco in a bowling alley. My mother never danced flamenco in a bowling alley. Nobody ever danced flamenco in a bowling alley, which is why when you hear the line, you just think, oh, horseshit, to yourself. You, you kind of know it's not true. Um, 
I worked, my first poetry workshop was with the great Etheridge Knight, African American poet, um, who scolded me. I mean, just scolded me ruthlessly about the pretentious shit that I put down on the page. I, way before poetry slams, he used to take our workshop out into bars and uh, to crowded bus stops in Minneapolis in the summer and make you read your poems. Uh, or put us on, at one point we even took a bus, got on a, bunch of, a bus with a bunch of people. Now, if you face a listing drunk <laughs> or a foot sore you know, commuter who's been working all day, you pretty much realize pretty fast what drivel your writing is, like how irrelevant it, it actually is when you see people. Here's a quote from him. Why is a little girl from Bumfuck, Texas, dragging Frederick Nietzsche, kicking and screaming into this poem? <laughs> when I bristled at him that I'd been a philosophy major in college, you know, which I dropped out of after two years, of course, he said, and that's all you're telling anybody, what your major is and what you took back in college. And you're, you're pointing back to your own head to tell us how smart it is. Now, at the time, my father, my much-loved oil worker daddy, was killing, drinking himself to death. And the one poem Etheridge kind of liked of mine was about a suicidal dog that I don't remember. I have a copy of the poem, but I remember it began, don't do it, dog. <laughs> it's kind of a great line, right? Um, uh, but that jokey riff, don't do it, was as close as I could come to writing out of how I actually <coughs> felt, which I, my father had had a stroke and was dying and was bedridden for five years, and it was, I was trying to send money home. It was a nightmare. So um, I'm going to wind this up in a minute. So for me, the history of writing is the history of deleting. I had this lightning stroke of luck. I blindly bumble in to one of the planets. I get into this graduate program, which happens to be one of the best conversations about poetry and fiction and memoir on the planet. No one was talking about memoir then. I mean, no one was writing memoir. Um, I roll into this graduate program, which I'd only been admitted in on, on probation. I had to go for a year and prove that I wasn't as big an idiot as I seemed. And um, and I remember the room where I first heard Jeffrey Wolf read from the first memoir, a contemporary memoir I'd, I'd heard, other than I'd read Maya Angelou, I'd read, uh, read a lot of books by people of color, Richard Wright, Black Boy, um, Malcolm, Autobiography of Malcolm X. My mother was involved in the civil rights movement and I was very interested. At, but, but when you read literature, literature was the stuff of all these white guys wearing deck shoes in The New Yorker. You know, we should, we, with the Cheever stories and everything, which I love, but that seemed to me like literature. But when I read these books by people of color, I thought, oh my God, you know, you can write about our people. It's so strange that I identified more with them. Well, you got a picture, Jeffrey Wolf. This is in August in Vermont, and it was hot, and there was a gale force fan. I remember that somebody had to turn off. Jeffrey had a kind of Hemingway beard and a polo shirt, and he looked like he'd be at home kind of propping up a martini or on a Cuban swordfish boat. He just looked extremely cool. His wife was this really elegant woman who everybody asked her opinion about stuff. He'd studied history at Princeton with Ted Wright, and he'd already published a best-selling biography of Harry Crosby, a Fitzgerald contemporary um, and sidekick uh, who had a kind of tragic tale, decadent tale that ended tragically in Paris. He had all the credentials you need, and yet he wore them all very lightly. He was hardy, and he brooked no shit, and he seemed worried about nothing but getting the right words in the right order. And it's 1978, and he comes into this room, and you've had all these, maybe, a hun maybe this many people, 100 people, who've been in workshops all day. Uh, our teachers then, I think Heather was 30. I was 23. And these are people who've mostly been slumped in there. They come in, it's hot, we're slumped in our chairs. We've been talking about writing since 9 o'clock in the morning. We were all drunk the night before. Um, and the minute he starts to read from the Duke of Deception, everyone just kind of perks up. Um, just to give you a short precis of what that's about, when Jeffrey was an undergrad, his, his father swanned into Princeton sporting a 
faux waspy Episcopal Ivy League background. Jeffrey later found out they were Jewish. And using Jeffrey's name, the old man runs up bills in all the stores of, of Jeffrey's friends at Princeton. That Jeffrey actually winds up getting kicked out of school because he has to pay off his father's debts before he can be, be readmitted. Um, and his father would wind up doing jail time for passing bad checks, and he'd be in mental institutions and dry out tanks. And years later, when Jeffrey got news of his father's death, he was summoned from a vacation place having feared that he was being called to the phone from the beach because it, one of his sons had been hurt. He had two beautiful sons at the time. And his response to the news is laid out in the Duke of Deception, the very first chapter, when he hears his father's dead. He says, thank God. Not because he's glad his father's dead, but he's so glad it's not one of his kids. And the whole book really explains that response. Not gratitude, again, that his father was dead. In order for Jeffrey to be free of his father, he had to kind of become the father that his father wasn't, um, that he kind of longed for. And the book is a chronicle of how that happened. And Jeffrey was one of the first people who talked to me about memoir. And I remember interviewing him about this book. And he said, the truth ambushes you. It had always been convenient to see my father in melodramatic terms as extraordinarily seedy or criminal, but the things I dined out on weren't emotionally accurate. So Jeffrey's inner enemy, which is something I talk to my memoir students about, it's an aspect of yourself that has to change over the course of your story. The, what keeps him from the story's core truth is his ancient habit of loving his old man and glamorizing him and trying to save him. And again, this is a guy, Papa Wolf, who just could care less about being a father. But Jeffrey gets stronger and more capable and keeps bailing his father out and bailing his father out and ultimately has to choose between himself and his father, which he does partly by becoming a father. Um, anyway, 1978, Jeffrey's up there, he's tall, he's got a strong voice. He read with great, he read haltingly. He never stuttered when you spoke to him, but when he read from this book, he developed terrible stutter. And to hear him read it and to watch the attention, I mean, the room was riveted by this man's pain. I always tell my students too, you have to put your nuts on the anvil. And um, that doesn't mean experimenting with line breaks. Uh, uh, the audience just exploded. I, I realized, I stood there and I watched him and it's sort of like he plows on and he stops and he drinks water. He plows on and he stops and he, and he was showing me a kind of courage that I knew that I didn't, I didn't have. I didn't have, but he was also, he was like some action movie hero to me, gunning down uh, the enemy that I had faced my whole life, which is these family lies. You know, it was heroic to me what he was doing. It was such an inspiring moment. I just thought, what guts, you know, this man has. And then the audience just goes crazy. Now let me tell you who's in the audience. This is all my, my uh, name dropping is about to start. So first there's the herd of poets that I went there to study with who I've been patting around behind like a puppy. Heather was there, Louise Gluck, Robert Haas, Ellen Bryant Voigt, Charlie Simic was there visiting. They all write very psychologically sharp dangerous stuff drawn in varying degrees of transparency from their own lives. Among the fiction writers there, because there was no nonfiction side, was Ray Carver, whose first book of partly autobiographical stories I've been dragging around Europe the year before. Uh, Jeffrey's brother, Tobias, Toby Wolf, who hadn't yet written This Boy's Life. But alongside him sat Frank, uh, Frank Conroy, whose stop time was already a cult classic and had been excerpted in the New Yorker where people presumed it was fiction. 
um, what are the odds, I now think, that I bumbled into that remote hive where arguably stood the best practitioners in memoir on the planet? Uh, am I suggesting some intelligent design drew me into this cabal? I think I am. But I didn't believe in such twaddle at the time. Okay, and I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Thank you. So, a question there. She's got a microphone for you. Right there, that lady with the... Is it Miss Starr? Yeah. I'm too blind to see. That's okay, I am too. Glasses now. I was very interested in Lit when you talked about moving to Syracuse or you talked about uh, being in a marriage that was dissolving and how delicate it was to write about the disillusion. Part of the writer is protective and has to be and it seemed that you did it, pulled it off with a lot of restraint and respect. And I just wonder what considerations as a writer you had on that specific topic. Well, thank you. That's, that's obviously, there were three really horrible uh, moral choices I, faded, I faced with Lit. And I, I rewrote Lit so many times that I actually broke the delete key on my keyboard. <laughs> So I threw away a thousand finished pages. I mean, that's finished pages. And I was years late, and they, I was on the verge of selling my apartment and giving them the advance back because I felt so frantic that I couldn't do this. Um, and the three things were my son, who's now 28, was then, I don't know, whatever the hell he was, 19, something like that, 20. Uh, my ex-husband, his father, um, also, writing about God for a secular audience is writing about doing, you know, it's like doing card tricks on the radio. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a believer, I, I converted to Catholicism, not even just, you know, a normal hippie thing, you know, but I couldn't be an Episcopalian, you know, or a Buddhist or something cool, you know, I had to be a Catholic. Um, uh, but yes, writing about my ex-husband was very hard. I notified him before, as I do everybody I write about, I notify them before I write. And I say, here is the moment to tell me, oh my God, oh no, oh please. When I have written this, I will show it to you. And you can correct for veracity. But um, I'm not, don't tell me not, to, tell me not to write it now. You know, and so I notified my ex-husband, and he, I said, you can either read it and bet the pages, or I will give you a pseudonym. Now, he's a poet who has written a lot about me, um, so, and about his own family, so that obviously makes it a lot easier if you're dealing with another artist. Um, but that was really hard. I really did three versions of writing about my marriage, and, and it took probably about a year. And it's not that big a section of the book. It's a very small section of the book, but it really it was very agonizing. The first draft, I was completely horrible, and he was completely gracious and lovely. Um, and, the, and the second draft, he was a complete bastard. And I was, you know, not sweet exactly, but whatever my version of sweet would be. Um, and then I realized what was hardest to write about was having been in love with him. Mm -hmm. That what's hard to write about isn't when somebody's beating your ass. It's easy to write about having your ass beat. You're the victim. What's hard to write about is falling in love with somebody where it's ended up in such a disaster. Um, that said, I have only, I've got to say, I've been very blessed in the, all the reviews I've gotten. I've been particularly blessed, <laughs> breast been particularly breast by Michiko Kakatani, um, who the only negative thing about any of my three books she has ever said is that she felt he was a little two-dimensional and waspy. And um, in that kind of way that wasp can be two-dimensionally portrayed. <laughs> I mean, Cheever doesn't do that, you know, for instance, but that's his milieu. 
Um, and someone said, well, isn't that kind of a pissy thing for her to say? I said, you know what? If I'd have done it perfectly, she'd have liked it. So it doesn't hurt my feelings. I mean, I, I ex I'm always surprised if anybody likes anything. But it, thank you for noticing. It was a real struggle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel when you when your fellow artists put you in their work? Do they call you beforehand? Nobody has ever called me. Do you recognize yourself? I never have. David Wallace supposedly wrote, you know, like his thousand word novel about me. And the only way I knew about it before it came out was that I ran into his editor and I was telling stories and he said, uh, oh, all these stories which are in the Liars Club are actually in this novel of David Wallace I'm editing. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and then I read in the, I think it was in Harper's, he had, they had, he had published an excerpt of people we knew in which he used their real names. People we knew from an anonymous group. And, um, and I called his editor and I said, make all of this go away. If it, I don't, he said, I'll send it to you to read. I said, I don't want to read it. I don't want to look at it. Make her be from Arkansas or Oklahoma. She didn't have to be from Texas. I don't care. I just, she, you can't have things that are in a book I'm about to publish, you know, like you just can't, you can't do that, so. Um, but when I read it, it didn't seem much like me. But. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Miss Melissa. Um, hi. You hi. mentioned a few minutes ago that you told, you, you started um, by saying that, that you had told your memoir class this, uh, and I think you said your inner... Inner enemy. Inner enemy. Can you talk for a minute about that? I think, um, I, I feel like there are three kinds of information in, probably in anything, in fiction or anything, but in, in memoir and novels, certainly there's physical, what I call carnality. There's like a carnal world, a physical world. And by that, I don't just mean physical description. I mean, if you're really paying attention, your body, I'm a carnal, particularly carnal person, I'm told. I can smell the difference in 2% milk and whole milk. I can, if the fish is a little off, I can smell it. I mean, I'm extremely, I can tell you the thread count of a sheet by, by running my hand on it. I have, I'm, I'm like the princess in the pea. And, and so I have, I'm extremely sensitive, as are most of you, probably most writers. But so there's the physical aspect. There is rhetoric or data or just information. And then there is what I call interiority or psychological complexity. Um, interior thoughts of the person. The difference in a good memoir and a bad one is, is carnality. In a bad memoir, there's no physical world. They're just kind of voices talking and then somebody telling you what to think, like a, like a newspaper article giving you rhetoric or data. Uh, in a good one, there's a carnal physical world that you can actually imagine yourself in. Um, in a great one, there's an interior or psychological space. You know, the Nabokov speak memory we were just reading in class, you know, the cradle rocks between an abyss, you know, and um, the minute you read that sentence, you just realize you're in the presence of a certain kind of thought and a certain kind of mind. Or the Harry Cruz, Harry Cruz's childhood biography of a place, which begins, my first memory is a, a place I've never been and it happens before I was born, and it involves my father, whom I never met. And the minute you hear that, you realize what his relationship to the truth is, what his relationship to time and history is, and that it's a book that's going to deal with the imagined and with Apocrypha. So I think creating an interior space constantly reminds a reader this is subjective experience. This is my experience. I am not... Um, I'm going to get to your question in one second. I am not, um, uh, I, I, I didn't transcribe this from video. It, it actually has a sense of your psychology at work. Now, all of my books have been structured when I find memoirs by nature episodic. A novel, as you know, is a complicated thing that has a plot and all these 
complicated threads that you have to weave together. A memoir, you're in the seventh grade, uh, seventh grade the next year you're in the eighth grade, and it kind of goes like that. But, um, and you hop over the dull parts. Well, in memoir, you have to find, I think, a through line, and the through line for me is always some aspect of myself that is preventing me from living in some, recognizing some fundamentally truth about how I'm supposed to live. So for instance, if you look at Tobias Wolff's This Boy's Life, I actually think I have this written down, hold on a minute. Um, in Toby's, like in Toby's This Boy's Life, you don't have a father, let's say you don't have a father, so you spend your boyhood strapping on these costumes of masculinity. You start your, the book opens, he's an Indian chief. He's got his mother to buy him an Indian chief costume at the truck stop, even though he knows she doesn't have any money and he shouldn't ask, but he cudgels her into it. So he's a manipulator and a sneaky little thing and his mother is, is a kind of hapless blonde Blondes, someone told me, are considered hot until proven otherwise. <laughs> so his mother is this hapless blonde, and he straps on, then he's a basketball player. Then his bullying stepfather forces him into a, a hand-me-down Eagle Scout uniform. And then he, he pretends to be a greaser and a badass and a, and, a, and a hood. And then he pretends to be Elvis. He pretends to be a preppy. He, he puts on a soldier's uniform and gets a gun and, and, and tracks pedestrians on the street. But the danger for him is that he's going to strap on, the, the enemy is not his bullying stepfather. It's that he's going to strap on that bullying sensibility and not fully become the man he's supposed to be. So that's an example of an inner enemy and how it ties together over the course of the book. For me in my last book, um, I have a son and I didn't have a mother. My greatest fear is that I'm going to become my mother, who in some ways was some great things. She was very smart. She was an excellent dresser. <laughs> um, she was funny as a, as a crutch um, and had all kinds of wonderful outlaw characteristics, but she was dangerous to children. Dangerous. Uh, drank like a fish, you know, and, you know, I remember one of her first encounters with my son when he was a child was to show him, when unbeknownst to me, the gun she carried in her purse when he was five years old. It's almost as if she were asking him to shoot himself. So how was I, over the course of that book, going to become an artist and a mother and reconcile my resentments of my original mother. And so that enemy is that aspect of myself that wants to reject her completely and also wants to get drunk and snort all the coke and kiss all the boys. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm interested in your memoir book. And I'm, um, Me too. <laughs> And um, I'm wondering, uh, if I'd love to ask you, what are your themes? What do you want us to, uh, to carry with you? But do you, are you including something in your, um, in your contents that you think we don't hear from other people? Is there anything special that, that you're bring, going no, to be nothing. bringing? Okay. No, I think. Well, then, I think, then I think tell the, me all no. your themes. No, I think the idea of interiority. I don't. I think people imagine with memoir. Right now, film and me and video are the dominant media. So people imagine that the more spectacle and whammies they get in mm -hmm. things, the better it'll be. That's why fiction right now, the big book last year that won the Pulitzer Prize is about a, a North Korean prisoner who has this relationship with the the Kim. What's his name? Kim Dong, I always think of him. <laughs> um, you know, and about all this stuff about the Korean prison system and blah, 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 blah. So you pick the most outrageous thing, the thing you know least about. Because we're in, 
a culture in love with information, you master all this arcane, obscure information, and then you write a book as far from yourself as you can get, and you make it as unbelievable and spectacular as you can. That's what movies are for. I don't know why fiction writers want to be, it's a shitty business for fiction. I think what fiction can do, what memoir can do, is show the interior life. That's mm -hmm. what Tolstoy did. That's why we still read that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what George Saunders does, mm -hmm. who's seen as an experimental writer, but whose, whose stories are very grounded in the human heart and in the reali psychological reality. They're, they're deeply psychological stories, very much informed by the Russians, I think, by Chekhov and, and, uh, and Tolstoy and Babel. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, it, is not, uh, it is not taking an event in your life and making it stranger so that the reader will feel estranged from your experience. It's taking a very strange <coughs> experience and making it normal mm -hmm. so that they understand. I knew my, book was, my first book was okay. My fear was that we would seem grotesque or unseemly when I loved my family. I didn't want people not to love my family. You know, I got letters of guy, old guys who are always asking my mother to marry him. I mean, God knows. If you're married seven times, it's, at what point do you say it's not them? You know, number four or number five, you know, at some point. And um, so I think this, this, the love of spectacle, which is, again, very appropriate for film and media, that's not what memoir can do. That's a first person in your heart thing. Mm -hmm. You're stuck with a first-person narration, and the reason people love them right now, I think, is because you're doing what fiction no longer does, yeah. which is to write very emotionally about stuff they're completely emotionally invested in and show some interior or psychological mm -hmm. complexity. Because all those other media are reductive. You know, they shrink them and make them two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that idea that it's not the most spectacular thing you have to start the reader. An example I like to give, I gave yesterday in class, is from Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You know, I have all these great, brilliant young students at Syracuse where I teach. We get like 700 applications for six positions I could never have gotten in. Um, and we, and we, I love turning down like a Yale Summa <laughs> for the woman who was a Barnum and Bailey clown. Like there's no, nothing more, because we just do it based on the work. It's not the academic credentials. So, um, what I love is I get these uh, magical realist things that begin like, and he walked out of the house and it was raining bricks. And you're like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> like, no one believes that. And if you look at the beginning of 100 Years of Solitude, you know, before all this magical, fabulous stuff happens, it begins when Colonel Aureliano Buendia, or Ho Jose Arcadio Buendia faced the but would face the firing squad, he would remember the day his father took him with the gypsies and showed him ice. And it begins in scientific miracle. It begins with the guy touching ice and saying, look at this, it's clear, but it's hot. It's cold, but it feels hot. And then it shows magnets. The next year the gypsies come and they bring magnets and magnets, and then they bring stronger and stronger magnets. So they have a magnet that sucks the pots and pans out of the houses. And then the, it's, the screws are coming unscrewed you know, from the boards. It begins in the magic of the everyday and takes the reader by the hand through the process where you're in the world where the woman is ascending with the sheets into heaven because she's so beautiful, Remedios the beauty. You know, so you've got to start in the quotidian. You've got to start where people are. And if you start with, you know, my mother standing over me with a butcher knife, then we're, we're going to be, then we're Jerry Springer. You know? So Great anyway, thing. that's what I think. Yes, ma'am, back there. Um, what do you do when there's, you're trying to write about something that you want to write about? a moment or an incident that's meaningful and deep and there's a reason that you want to write about it and you can't remember a lot. I don't, I say I can't remember it. I speculate and fantasize and I say to the reader, I mean I was very much urged by my editors and the publishers at Viking and, and Liars Club to invent a scene. Here's the problem for me with inventing, the minute I start inventing, 
I'm in hell. I will only invent to correct, and I don't know why I'm like that. I'm just shameless. I would just, if I could just make up how it was. When I tried to write Liar's Club as a novel, the character was me, was beautiful and noble and wise, and volunteered at the nursing home and did calculus, you know, I mean, at six, you know, I was just like not, the not me, me, just somebody who is not me. And so um, I was very much, there's a scene in the Liars Club where my mother has gone crazy, has bought a bar, moved to Colorado, married my uh, stepfather. She was off on a, she'd inherited a lot of money, which she spent in a year. And um, I was encouraged to, at one point, we call my father and say, it's too crazy here, we want to come home. So we fly home, my mother flies us back to see my father. When I say goodbye to my mother, she's so messed up, I don't know that I'll ever see her again. I mean, she had two other children, she left. So my mother was a, you didn't know. My mother would say she was going to the grocery store and be gone for a week. So you just didn't know. And my, pub my publisher kept saying, but that would be a really interesting scene if you remembered that scene of saying goodbye to your mother. And I said, you know, I remember the guy who, I remember the guy who took us to the airport. I remember flying. I remember I hit the guy in front of me on the seat laying back with my Barbie doll and her head came off <laughs> um, because he leaned back in my personal space and I took it as an affront. Um, <laughs> um, so I said to the reader, it must have been very hard for me to say goodbye to my mother. Uh, I don't remember it. Maybe not remembering says more about how hard it was than anything I could marshal. So I think it's about your relationship with your reader. And that's the other thing about writing. You have to write. The memories that are vivid to you, I think, are vivid for psychological reasons. So it's why I don't do research. I don't go and interview everybody else who was there. Those are their memories. I don't know what's vivid to me. Um, what I do is I write it out and then I show it to people who were there. Uh, Star, that was the other thing I did with my, the pages about my husband I was so nervous about. He didn't want to read them. Um, he wanted a pseudonym and I changed some details of who he is, though obviously everybody who knew us knew who he was. Um, but I sent them to our couples counselor. I tracked her down <laughs> in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> and, um, and just said, would you read these? You know, it's, uh, I just don't know if it's fair mm -hmm. or if it seems like I've left something out or I'm really misrepresenting. And she said, I remember other things. And we talked on the phone. She told me other things she remembered, but they weren't really about my story. So mm -hmm. do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, thanks. There were hands over here somewhere. No? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is completely theoretical. There's a, there's a call. Oh, is this on? Okay. This is completely theoretical. It harkens back to something you said about checking with your ex-husband before you started writing it. Let's say, and I know this has never happened to you, uh, it's a current husband that you want, that you have a daily relationship with. Hey, Michael. <laughs> completely theoretical, Michael. I'm doing a book on our sex life now. I haven't told him about it. Or your son, or your son, let's say, or your sister, you know, someone you're in, you know, daily contact with, and they say, Mary, please, don't write that memoir about blah, blah, blah. That's mortifying to me. Or, or they say something a little bit less horrifying to a writer, such as, well, you can write it, but I am so uncomfortable. This is going to make my life miserable for two years. Then what do you do? Um, I've never had anybody say that. I did have two things happen. One was that my friend Meredith in my second book, who's like my best friend in high school, used to cut herself and wound up having actually a terrible, terrible time. Cut her throat, tried to kill herself. I mean, really went totally just nutty as a stomp piss ant for the rest of her life. And I remember, you know, I checked her in and out of hospitals when we were kids. Um, and she was at Duke Law School when she first went really crazy. Number two in her class on the Law Review. Very brilliant girl. Um, and there's a scene when we're in high school and she's trying, she's cutting her wrist. And I told her before I wrote it, here's what I want to write about your brother going to prison. Uh, and how we would go on the bus to visit him, which I wound up actually not including, but I did write that he was in prison. I want to write about us getting high. I want to 
write about um, having sex for the first time at your mother's house. I want to write about um, sitting around smoking pot naked. I want to write about you trying to cut yourself. I went to fine, 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 all that stuff happened, no problem. After the book was done, she was uh, dying, and she said, um, I don't want you to publish that I cut myself. I said, why? She said, because it would upset your mother, my mother. I said, Mary Ellen, you cut your throat like four times. Your mother knows that you were suicidal. I mean, this is not. So we talked about it, and I decided to cut the chapter. Basically, I went down to Texas, and I talked to her and to this other girlfriend of mine. And they suggested, well, why don't you have it that some other girl is trying to, I see her in the bathroom, and I watch her doing this, and, I, and my guilt is I don't tell anybody. I don't talk to, I don't try to help her. I mean, I try to help her by protecting her secret, which obviously, from an adult point of view, is a dumb thing to do. And um, our other friend, after I went down to Texas, called me. Let's call her, I call her Stacy in the book. And I said, it's not the same if I see a stranger do it. I, I'll just cut the, I'd rather cut the chapter than have a stranger do it. Because it's, what's hard is it's my friend. It's a real friend of mine. It's not just gr girl X, you know. And Stacy said, uh, why don't you put in, and Mary Ellen was dying at the time of liver cancer. And she said, uh, Stacy said, why don't you put in that it was me? And Mary Ellen said, when my mother dies, you can put back that it was me. You can change it. So that's what I did. Um, her mother died shortly after she died, hung herself. Not a happy town. So, yes, sir. Um, as a poet who has worked, as a poet who has worked with prose quite extensively, do you find that your verse sort of that that it either freed freed you up to write? Pros or uh, what, what's the um, sort of relationship between the two well, areas I think, of your writing? You know, Joyce said it best. Everybody starts out to be a poet, then realizes it's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you. I think, I think when called to, you know, one of the great lessons I learned in graduate school was from Robert Haas, and he said one way to make a poem better is to make every line in it better. You never think of that, right? <laughs> a line and make it a better line, you know? And so if you spend a lot of time doing that, you know, I was, uh, another quote, I guess, from my class yesterday was I, I in my first draft of, of the Liars Club where my mother took me to college, um, I'm sorry, lit, my mother took me to college, it began, you know, mother drove me to college in her yellow station wagon and, um, mm -hmm. We stopped every night at the Holiday Inn and got drunk on screwdrivers. And then it turned out something like, you know, Mother's Yellow Station Wagon moves like a Monopoly icon between fields of Iowa corn with cinnamon-colored silos, or cinnamon-colored barns and rusted silos in the distance. It's just more interesting language, just more vivid. Mm -hmm. It also establishes a point of view I could not possibly have seen which is again an interior, one of those interior things. I'm sort of saying to the reader, obviously this is a created scene. You know, did mm -hmm. my, mother, my mother did indeed drive me and we did go through fields of Iowa corn and we did have a particular conversation as I remember in that car. Um, but again, it sort of reminds the reader that it's a written thing and not mm -hmm. just. So I think it helps to make language better. Right. Yes, ma'am. I've been publishing uh, chapters from my memoirs, individual stories, just to see if people like it. And uh, some of the time, they, most of the time they like it, but some of the time, the comments are things like, great, even if it isn't true, again and again. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly true. So when the truth is so unbelievable, it's not coming out as true, should we tone it down a bit? Should I just remove that chapter? You should write it better. That's the solution. You have to write it better. You have to ask yourself yes. where the reader is. Yes. And you have to make it more physically vivid so that you are almost like an avatar for the reader in the scene. You have to make it a real physical, like a novelist does, a real physical three-dimensional world. Mm 
and, and uh, slow down and, and show your innards inside that scene so that the, the, the reader can be where you are, I think. Yes. That's my guess. When it's dull, make it better. That's my plan. Uh, there's Miss Stark. Sorry to ask two questions. I'll but go for it. Well, you said something really interesting, like when you were up in Vermont with all these wonderful people starting out, nobody was writing memoirs. Then there, I just wanted you to trace the memoir arc, because there seemed to me a certain time when so many memoirs were being written, and they had to take the occasion one step higher to get published, like, I just want to say that when it reached sleeping with my father or hitting up on, on... Let me tell you, I think Catherine Harrison's The Kiss is a great book, and I think she got screwed like a tie goat by the uh, media. I, I mean, her book about incest with I her I do, phone. too, and I read it, Mary. Oh, yes. I yeah. just wondered, could you just trace the art? Yeah, I mean... Do you think memoir could go from now, or... Well, I think, again, it's doing the, the job that fiction used to do. I think part of the reason there's a surge of interest in memoir is that there's a kind of metafiction, hyperintellectual fiction, fabulous fiction, bigger, stranger, faster, funnier, more bizarre, more bizarre, more bizarre, bigger, 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 bigger. And people want to know what it's like to be a human being and how you keep loving the people who hurt your damn feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, it's just too hard to be alive a lot of times when people die and stuff. It sucks. Yesterday's Times for Wall Street Journal. Wait a second, Ms. Joan, they're passing you a microphone. Uh, yesterday's Times or the Journal, uh, there was an article about new movies that were coming out and there was a big picture of Tom Hanks and they are... It's the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world, the no, monster, the Spider-Man. No, 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 no. No? Wasn't that? There's a real movie? It was a real movie about real incidents. They were non-fiction. Oh, biopics. But that's right. And that there's a big run towards them. And this was the Phillips story or uh, some, some person Right, like or that. Masters of Sex on TV, the Masters and Johnson story. Or, but it's no, like they're right. making the memoirs or the true stories now that that's the attraction. Well, what I was going to say is that um, what happened in the... Well, but still, the hundreds of millions of dollars in the movie industry are really being, movies are being made right now, because I'm a, in this business a tiny little bit, for f international distribution, and they all want franchise and, and explosions. So it's not, they're not making movies for us anymore. They're making movies for the world. And if you can make a hundred, you know, twenty billion dollars, you know, doing another Superman, then you'll do that. Um, but I was going to say the arc of memoir is partly related to this. It was a very, I remember Jeffrey Wolf saying to me, it's an outsider's art and, and in this same interview. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, it's like writing the Lord's Prayer on a grain of rice. It's something like only a weirdo would do. And I think of those memoirists who were right there. Again, there are all these, I think, people of color, you know, writing memoirs uh, around racial identity in the early 60s, a lot of those books, for me, again, as a reader, prefigured, uh, you know, kind of this memoir, all these white guys in the 70s, uh, Frank, Conroy, Jeffrey, Toby, uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, again, another wonderful book, par uh, partly about uh, gender and racial identity. Um, uh, uh, Nabokov, Speak Memory was, but before that, uh, if, you look at, if you look at what ha Mary McCarthy had to go through with Memories of the Catholic Girlhood, which was excerpted in the New Yorker in the late 40s, published in 51, she wrote at the beginning of each chapter, um, I didn't have a notebook at the time where I was writing down exact conversations. Conversations to this effect, however, did take place where possible. I've looked up, you know, dates and blah. I realize I got the date wrong of when we are first arrived in Seattle because the Spanish flu was no, 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 no. No one's interested. That's at a time when objective history still existed. People still believe politicians were honest. God was in heaven, all was right with the world. And, and what happened, I mean, another seminal book that I was trying, 
feeling for my brain is dispatches, writing about Vietnam. The, it's the first time that we understood that Robert McNamara's report of what was happening was not as accurate as Michael Hare's where he was tripping half the time. You know, that subjective experience is corrupt, but the admission of the corruption is what makes us now say it's more honest. It's more natural, as the Romantics want us to say, capital R Romantics, you know, it's, it feels truer in some fundamental way. So with the erosion of objective truth, probably starting, as James Woods would say, when they started teaching the Bible as literature in the, in the 19th century in England, with the erosion of objective truth, came the ability for memoirs to use novelistic devices, like description, like telescoping time, like going back and forth in time, uh, like talking about the nature of memory and consciousness. Freud's notion at the turn of the century that the unconscious was truer somehow, that childhood was a, a, a more natural state, that there was a, you know, these three separate us's and that some were truer than others. So I think all of those influences in the last century funneled toward making memoir a viable uh, towards the end of the, the last century, the later, you know, from the 70s on, a viable form. And again, I, I think forms rise and fall. I always think of poetry, like how stupid poets were at the beginning of the 19th century. You think about novelists like Dickens and, you know, you know, they're writing these gritty urban stories, you know, and poets are writing about fairies, you know, and uh, people stop reading poetry. You know, by the end of the century, you get to, there's Matthew Arnold, and it's just, you know, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, you know. And then T.S. Eliot comes in, and, and as William says, you know, an, an atom bomb went off. So I think different forms rise and fall. I mean, novels, when they first came out, were seen as sleazy because they weren't true. And now it's a much more exalted artistic form, and memoir is sort of the low-rent, ugly, little retarded sibling. <laughs> so I mean retarded in a loving Christian way. <laughs> no, I used to work at a place called the North Haven Home for Retarded Women. And I, I know it's not the word you're supposed to use anymore, but... Anybody else? Mentally challenged? Is that the phrase? <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, ma'am. One more. Okay. Um, you, Ms. Rinaldi. <laughs> I love how you use everyone's last name. Um, you, you talked about um, how you, know, you started out trying to be this other intellectual, cool French person. Um, and you had to kind of struggle for years to get to the truth of who you were. But really what are my advantages? What am I better at than other people? It's, right. it's that everybody, everybody's talent has a particular nature. Right. And in my experience of 30 years of teaching, every student I've ever had, almost to a one, very few exceptions. There's some students who come in, know what they're doing, and they do that, and then they do a little better, a little better, a little better, a little, almost always there's a psychological sense of what it means to be a writer that interferes with their ability to tell the stories they have to tell, to tap in. I mean, my father, my father spoke in poetry. I mean, if it was raining really hard, he would say, you know, it's raining like a cow pissing on a flat rock. I mean, that's a line of poetry. That's the idiom that when the Liars Club came out that everybody loved. That's what I was trying to hide. That's what I could do better than other people. You know, it, it's, you know, it, using that idiom and using those experiences that were so haunting to me, they haunted me my whole life. Why wouldn't I write them directly? Why would I write about some woman having shock treatment? I don't know. I, it's just now I look at it, it seems so obvious. But um, it's why I often say to people, if you don't, if you aren't writing, if you have something you dread writing, write it first. It doesn't have to go first in the book. Write it first, get it out of the way. See, what, see where you're gonna, but my experience is you push it down here, it comes up there. You know, I would not write about my father's death and I would, every poem I had would have a little old, old man in it. Or Catherine Harrison, I remember somebody saying about that book, The Kiss, her incest book. Oh, well she wrote this to cash in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
She wrote it because her first two novels were obsessed with incest. And she was so haunted by the story, she had to lance it like a boil, or else that she'd never write anything else. You know, and so I think we don't get to choose the nature of our talent. We're talented in the ways we're talented, and they're usually the ways, the things that people like about you. Like I have a student who was always trying to look like really sexy, this guy. He was a very talented poet, very like kind of like a real player kind of guy. But I'd known the kid since he was five years old, as it turned out, back in Texas. And what was great about the kid, he was really sweet. He was actually extremely tender-hearted, like help an ant with a stick kind of kid. You know what I mean? And that that part of himself that he was trying to hide was actually the, where his talent was. You know? So I just think often we avoid what we're really good at. And it's often, again, what people like most about you. So, everybody want to eat? <laughs> Thank you.